And if we were to summarize the last few weeks, I, th- I think they've just been exciting topics, exciting messages. And if we were to summarize them, I think we would say that, that good and evil are real, that heaven and hell are real, that God has a plan uh, for how he will put the world back in order and how he will deal with evil. But what we choose to focus on and how we spend our lives and what we believe affects how we fit into that plan. So heaven and hell are real. And the first question, just diving right in, that we need to answer about hell is why does hell exist? Because the first question we tend to ask or the human mind wants to ask about hell is how could a loving, how would a loving God create, why would he create hell in the first place? But that question reveals really the problem in the first place and the flaw in our understanding. And it shows that, that we don't really understand the righteousness of God and the horror that is sin. And the reason, the reason why the new heaven and the new earth will be so great is because the righteousness of God is going to come and purify every element of wickedness from our future and ensure that heaven is a perfect place, a pristine place filled with the righteousness of God. And that has to happen. It it has to happen because there are some very wicked things happening on earth today. And if we are all eternal beings, which we are, and if every spirit alive is an eternal being, and if Satan is an eternal being, which he is, there's never a point where Satan ceases to exist, and given the nature of our sin, when it's stripped away, when our sin is stripped away from a Friday or a Saturday night or when it's stripped away from something fun and entertaining, and when it's stripped away from, uh, even Christians would say, well, some sin is fun, but when it's stripped away from that and sin really gets its teeth, sinks its teeth into humanity, humanity turns ugly. And I mean the ugliest form of ugly that you can imagine. In fact, I, I had come up with about three or four scenarios of things happening on the earth today, even happening in our city, and was going to mention them, and I honestly cannot find the composure to do it. I would stand up here and and weep, and especially in some services where there may be some young children. But there are things happening on the earth today that would make the human mind melt in wonder of how someone could be that depraved. But the reason our depravity will not be a problem in heaven is because God is going to come righteously and cleanse the earth and rid the earth of the corruption and the corrosion of sin forever so that all who are standing in heaven will praise God for the cleansing power of the holiness and righteousness of God. So with that in mind, I realize that's a, that's a heavy intro, and it, it doesn't get much lighter for a while, but it does, so, so stay with me. But let's talk about two reasons why hell exists. And number one, hell exists for God to deal righteously with Satan, if you'd write that in. You see, a lot of people think that Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of hell, and that he's tormenting people there, and that we've just got this image of Satan, and you know, I mean, people dress as this image during Halloween, and they got the horns, and he's down in hell, ruling hell with a pitchfork, and poking people, and mocking people, and, and that's really not the case. In fact, hell is empty right now. Uh, just as believers die and are separated from their bodies and go to the present heaven, and they await the resurrection, unbelievers die and go to a place the New Testament calls Hades, where they await the resurrection and the final judgment themselves. And it's not until after the resurrection and after the judgment that anyone is cast into hell. But there is a word for the place that Satan has, where Satan is king, and where Satan has dominion and power. And it's called earth. And Satan is the god of this earth. 
He's the prince of this world. And, and he will be that. He will hold that position until God comes and removes him of that position violently and forcefully. And then he will be cast in to hell. And we see it here uh, when Jesus is teaching on the final judgment. He says he'll turn to them and say, depart from me, you who are accursed into the eternal fire prepared for who? For the devil and his angels, which we know as the demons. And number two, hell exists for God to deal righteously with unbelievers. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9, he will punish those who do not know God. That's why, I mean, one of, the, one of the things we desire for you is to know God. He will punish those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now, in most of the places where Jesus is talking about hell, which he talks about often, He's using a word referring to Gehenna, and it's a real place. Gehenna is a real place outside the city of Jerusalem. It has its history in the Old Testament days where some of the false gods would have sacrifices made to them there. Most notably, and you find this in any research on Gehenna, the god of Molech, and children were sacrificed in this place called Gehenna, and because of that, it was cursed by God. And moving forward to the time of Jesus, this valley outside the city of Jerusalem was a place where trash was perpetually burning. So all of the trash in the city and all the sewage in the city would be put in this place and some agent, maybe sulfur, would be used to continue the fire burning. So when Jesus was teaching about heaven and hell, he would reference a physical place that they could see and smell. And he would say, just like there's this place down there that burns by day and by night, and there's this stench, and you see that cloud, and it rises up from it, and it's burning trash and sewage. That's the way I'm going to reference an eternity without the grace of God. So what is hell like? Well, let's just write down a few things Jesus taught us about hell. Because you don't really need to hear from a preacher tonight. You need to hear from Jesus. So let's look at what he taught us And number one. He taught us that hell is worse than the worst physical persecution you could face. And there are many accounts in the New Testament of what happened to believers who were trying to follow God in the midst of great opposition to Jesus. And this has been true all throughout the history of the church. People are being persecuted and tortured even today. Yes, certainly today because of their faith. And Jesus taught that as bad as that is, as horrifying as that is, it doesn't even compare to what eternity without the grace of God would be like. And I couldn't fit all the passages of Scripture in your outline tonight, so I listed the verses we'll read from, and then you can follow along on the screen or in your Bible if you like. Matthew 10, starting in verse 28, Jesus says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And some of the people he's talking to would be sawed in half, quartered by horses, burnt alive, boiled alive, skinned alive. And he says, don't be afraid of that. Don't be afraid of the people who do these things to you because something matters more. And then he comes around his care for us, which I just want to put out there because there is so much grace in the gospel. Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And look how he just makes the point again. He says, whoever acknowledges me before others... I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven, but whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. Number two, Jesus says that hell is a place of regret and sorrow. Uh, hell is not a, an eternal opportunity to enjoy sinful pleasures that you've known on earth. And we have all have heard or know someone who's, who's said, well, I don't really mind going to hell and just keeping the party going, but hell is human misery forever. 
Because sin always leads to emptiness. Sin is fun for a little while, but it corrupts and corrodes. And that's the part of sin that we are left with in hell. In this passage, Jesus is talking about good seed and bad seed being sown among his flock. Matthew 13, 37. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Verse 40, as the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Number three, Jesus says hell is eternal punishment. Uh, So hell is not a short reckoning and then nothing. Hell isn't falling short of heaven and then disappearing into nothingness. Hell is eternal punishment, according to Jesus. Let's look at this, a larger passage here, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Number four. Hell is perpetual fire. Now, people will ask, is, is, uh, is the fire literal or is it figurative? And, and most of the scholars, honestly, that you would probably lean towards would say that it is figurative. Uh, but just going to the text and reading the text and not taking anything away or not adding anything to, I don't think you can discount the fact that there's fire there. And obviously, it's not a consuming fire where people are being annihilated, but the imagery and the word pictures Jesus use tell us that it's perpetual fire. He says in Mark 9, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Aren't you glad we have a better hope than that? That we have Jesus living in us. But, I mean, he's saying here that if you have something in your life 
and it's powerful and it's ruling over you, you've got to do the most forceful thing you can do to get rid of that thing in your life. And sometimes we wonder why we don't have victory and why we don't walk in the fullness of God and why we don't have the Spirit of God working in our life. And, and, and we wonder where the power is. And it's because we have things that in our world that we are just accommodating, that we're just fine with. And Jesus says, move that stuff out. For it is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. In number five, Jesus says, hell is a place of conscious awareness that something better is unattainable. And Jesus told a, a story in his life uh, of of the beggar named Lazarus, a beggar named Lazarus, and he's, he's begging for crumbs and scraps at the gate of this rich man, but the rich man never gave Lazarus anything. Luke 16, uh, starting in verse 22, the time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called out to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all that, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. So even in Hades, the the, the person was aware that there's another place, aware of a different outcome, yet uh, uh, unattainable. And I I just want to clarify that hell is a place void of God. But obviously God is omnipresent so that it's really not, that's not true in every way. Um, 2 Thessalonians describes hell as a place void of God. But then Revelation 14 describes the fact that angels and the lamb actually see the suffering in hell. And the thing you you get when you connect those two passages and see the whole story is that people in hell are aware that there is a God with whom they can never have a relationship with. And it's, it's a very tough reality to deal with, to see what you refuse, to see what you refuse to ever acknowledge in your heart. And we didn't touch on all the references from Jesus about hell, but But we've heard from Jesus, not some random preacher or you didn't hear from Ryland really in this. You didn't hear from a theologian. You heard from Jesus and what Jesus teaches about hell. But let's come around this question and ask, what does the cross teach us about hell? If there's anything that the cross teaches us, it's that Jesus wasn't inconclusive on the subject of hell. I know the human mind wants to default. I mean, I've been in this for a while and been at kind of at the bottom of this for a while now. And I know the human mind wants to default to a universalistic point of view. That everyone somehow is going to make it. That somehow this amazing God we love and we serve, somehow it's going to be messy, but he's going to work it all out at the end of the day. But to that point of view is a cross standing in the middle of history. And that cross tells us some important things that Jesus believed about hell. And number one is that there is something to be saved from. 
The cross teaches us that Jesus is a savior. But if there is a savior, there must be something from which to be saved. And let me just ask you some questions, but I do not want you to answer back or raise your hand or anything like that. But I'm just going to ask these in the form of questions for you to, to process this with me. How many of you believe in Jesus? And you say in your mind that that's me or now I'm just checking this out or I'm thinking about it. I haven't decided yet. No, he isn't. Or yes, that's, that's me. How many of you believe in Jesus? How many of you believe that Jesus is a savior? How many of you believe that Jesus is your savior? So the question is then, what did Jesus save you from? And I think we would answer that or we're going to answer that. Well, he saved me from my sin. And that's a right answer all day long. Absolutely true. Or that he saved me from my, myself. Or he saved me from a life less than the very best. And all those are right answers. But Jesus could have fixed those problems a lot of different ways. Those problems themselves, Jesus could have solved that many different ways. The main thing that Jesus saved us from is the righteous wrath of God. That's what Jesus saved us from. And when we talk about God, we normally lean towards his grace, as we should. We lean towards his mercy, his kindness, his patience, his, uh, his greatness, his forgiveness, his perfection. But without the wrath of God, there is no gospel to celebrate. Without the wrath of God, there isn't even a heaven for us to look forward to today. You, you see, what Jesus saw was Jesus saw a tidal wave of holiness coming to earth to cleanse the earth of its sin. And he gave us a way out. And in the wake of what is coming, Jesus appeared to take the brunt of the coming tidal wave of the holiness, the righteousness, and the wrath of God so that in Jesus we could be hidden and covered by his righteousness. So, so that when the wrath of God comes, we are in the shelter of his wings. We are under the covering of the blood of Jesus. We're under the, under the covering of a Savior who gave his life in our place, who took on our sin and absorbed the righteous wrath of God in our place. And he suffered and died and was buried and descended into the lower parts of the earth. And Jesus believes in hell. And he did all that so that we could be covered by the righteousness of Christ himself. So what Christ did when he took the payment and the penalty is he transferred into your account his righteousness and transferred into his account your sinfulness. And now there is a permanent once and for all covering for your sin. The righteousness of Jesus saves us. Yes, from ourselves. Yes, from less than the best. Yes, from sin. But to save us from the righteous wrath of God. And, and that's why the cross is so gruesome. That's why Jesus didn't take on the sin of the world and die in his sleep. It's why Jesus wasn't euthanized. That's why he, 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 didn't, he didn't die simply. No, he saw the full effects of the gruesome aftermath of sin and all of what it does to humanity. And, all, and it was all laid out on an innocent life. And at the cross, we saw what God justly poured out what God's justly poured out wrath looks like. At the same time, seeing God's love for us as he was willing to sacrifice his own son to do it. Let's look at it in scripture, Romans 5. Uh, it's, it, this is kind of the hinge of the book of Romans. It says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. 
But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I'm sure many, many of us have heard that passage. And that's kind of where our confidence kind of fizzles out or maybe we even stop. But these next verses are so essential. Verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So we get saved from something. And, and Paul in Romans says that that something is the wrath of God. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, reconciled shall we be saved through his life and on that day of holiness when the righteousness and the glory of God is revealed and comes to us and here comes the righteousness of God unbridled everything in its wake is going to be covered but God offers a covering for us even before the cross John the Baptist said this is what it's all about. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So if Jesus didn't believe uh, the day of the righteous wrath was coming and all evil and sinfulness would be cast out of God's presence, why would he put his life in our place? His belief in hell was so compelling that it compelled him to put himself in peril at the highest degree. And on the flip side of that, Christ has come. And now out of the tomb erupted life and erupted hope and all kinds of opportunity for us to come and receive Christ's covering for our sin. So in the same moment when the holiness of God is fully released on the earth, we will be covered by what Christ has issued for us when his blood was shed for us on the cross. Number two, unchecked sin This is what the cross teaches us about hell. Unchecked sin leads to a gruesome death. And hell is a a place where people go to pay the penalty for sin. It's where they go to pay the wage, where they, they go to die. And the cross represents the death that Jesus really died for us. And number three, no one can make it to God On their own merit. Um, uh, Let's just go down this this road for a moment. Uh, Again, don't don't raise your hand or anything, but how many feel like it it wouldn't be hard to believe that somehow this is all going to work out in the end? Like, yeah, I see the passages. I hear what you're saying. I I, I know what's going on. But you you would say that it's It's all going to work out in the end. I say, I believe in in the Bible. I believe in hell. I believe in Jesus. But I reserve this part of my thinking that this will all work out for everyone someday. And that's a human desire, but it breaks down the character of God. Because without the wrath of God, there is no righteousness of God. The two are interwoven. And you can't have one side of that equation without the other. But here's the big story. For us, we've got to come to terms with the fact that we can't make it to God on our own merit. Let's just use the best case scenario. Let's say there's this little old lady in the Midwest, and she's a kind and gentle soul, but she doesn't believe in Jesus and hasn't received the work Christ has done for her on the cross to receive her covering. Isn't there a way... For her, somehow, at the end of the day, a little, a back door into heaven. And yes, the mass murderers and the human traffickers and the pedophile and Satan are all going to the lake of fire to be tormented by God. We can see that. But what about this little old lady in Cass County? Surely there's a back door for her at the end of the day where she can enter through even though she never really declared with her mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in her heart that God raised him from the dead. But the place that breaks down, the place where that breaks down is the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross. 
to save us from the righteous wrath of God. And if there is, a, if there is heaven, if there's a way in apart from that cross, is Jesus not the most foolish person ever to live? If the cross didn't have to happen, Jesus isn't someone to be worshipped. He's someone to be pitied. If there's another way, if there's a back door someday, somehow, Jesus did not believe in another way or a back door when he said it was finished on the cross. And he is teaching us by his death on the cross that he is convinced of everything he ever said in the gospel about hell. And lastly, the biggest thing that the cross teaches us about hell is that number four, hell is avoidable. Hell is avoidable. <laughs> I would have said amen and probably stood up and done a lap right there. <laughs> What the cross teaches us mostly about hell is that hell is avoidable. I mean, the guy hanging on Jesus' side escaped it with his last breath. And when you put hell on the table, it's real and it's gruesome in every way. And it's the most difficult thing for us to process with our minds. But everywhere you see hell, you see God's grace overwhelming the conversation. And the person in the story we don't talk about very often is the other thief on the other side who ridiculed Jesus. And I just imagine him on the day of all days when the holiness of God is coming. And the righteous wrath of God is coming like a tidal wave. And, and he has to come to grips with that the guy in the very same situation escaped it with his last breath. And he chose in his last breaths to ridicule and mock Jesus. But everywhere in the gospel where you see, where you see this subject, you see God saying, I've made a way. It's avoidable. His name is Jesus. Receive him. Accept him. Believe on him. Cling to him. Avoid death. And this is God's heart for us. And we want to ask the question, how could a good God really send someone to hell when the real question is, how could anyone reject the love of God? How could anyone reject the love of God? How could anyone reject a God who gave his own son to be crushed so we could avoid hell and have the assurance of life forever in him? And we change the question from how could a loving God send someone to hell? I, I, I just, I'll tell you, I've wrestled with this for a while and I've asked that question. And it's, it is the most ridiculous question to ask someone who sacrificed his son and laid his own life down. And the question is, how could you not accept the love of God? And so often when it comes to this topic, we want to know how God is going to work this out for everyone else before we'll believe it. Well, what about the people who have never heard the gospel? And what about these types of people? And what about uh, this scenario? What's God going to do here? And what I would suggest is that we stop worrying about how anyone else is going to respond to God or how God is going to righteously, justly deal with anyone else. He is going to worry about that. And the challenge for me and for you is to not worry about how God is going to deal with anyone else, but to start worrying about what we are given the power and to worry about, and that's how you're going to respond to God and how he will deal with you based on that response. And if you remember the passage we read earlier about the rich man who died and he's crying out across this chasm to Abraham, he goes on, the story didn't finish there, he goes on and he asks Abraham to send Lazarus back to his five brothers because as he put it, surely they will listen to a man who's risen from the dead. 
And then they, they will believe and then they'll turn to God and, and they won't end up in this place of torment with me. And Abraham tells him, if they haven't listened to Moses and the prophets, they, they're not going to listen to anybody. And so many times we reject the thought of hell and we question God because we can't bear the thought of loved ones who have died, who never believed. We can't bear the thought of their suffering. All the while, they are crying out for you to believe. And if they are to be consoled in any way, it will be from the fact that you have turned to God. And God is clear, he does not want anyone to perish. But we either agree with God or we don't. And we heard from Jesus, and we either agree with Jesus or we don't. And we have that prerogative today. We could leave here and not agree with Jesus. And I just implore you today to put your hope in Jesus and choose life in Jesus. Christ. I want to close with this verse in in Deuteronomy. God is speaking. And God says, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live by loving the Lord your God and obeying his voice and by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. This is God. He says, choose life. Choose life. Let's pray together. Well, God, we can't believe any of this without your spirit, without you speaking to our hearts, piercing through all our defenses, And whispering to us now that deep down, that this is the way it is. And I pray that you would do that now. That you would do what I can't do, or what no amount of argument or preaching can do, which is to speak to us and tell us this is true. And once you've done that, I pray that you would show us where to go, that you'd show us how to turn to you, how to, how to walk through the door that you have opened through the blood of Christ for anyone, no matter who they are or what they've done. And as we do it, we, that we would have this sense of a weight being lifted, that even though we still sin and make mistakes, even though we still relapse, that we have this sense of being brought to life and belonging to you in such a way that nothing could ever separate us again. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.